Welcome to the Fresh Heart Project. I'm Zareen, a consultant cardiologist and your host. Today, we're talking about why food is medicine with none other than Dr. Rupi Aujla, an NHS general practitioner and best-selling author with three cookbooks. Did you know that eating well has medicinal effects? It not only protects your heart, but it can change your brain, alter your mood, support your immune function and reduce inflammation. This is Rupi's powerful message. Through his platform, The Doctor's Kitchen, he educates us on the beauty of food and the effect it has on your health. I met him a few years ago after recommending one of his cookbooks to a patient of mine who's looking for healthy recipes. He has such a wonderful, non-judgmental, pragmatic approach to food. And most importantly, he makes eating healthily easy and delicious. Listen in to hear why he believes food is medicine. Rupi, we're absolutely delighted to welcome you to the Fresh Heart Project. Thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And uh, uh, I, uh, I've wanted to repay the favour for a while. So uh, I really appreciate it and uh, the opportunity to chat to you again. Absolutely. Oh, well, Rupi, I love following you on social media and I've been following you for ages. But I've really been quite distracted by Nutmeg the Pooch. How beautiful <laughs> is your little dog? How can you focus having her around? Oh, it's, it's really tough, actually. So she's one years old. She just became one years old, actually. Um, she's a little cavapoo and she's tiny. She just hasn't grown. She, she must be the runt of the lifter because uh, we have a friend of ours who's got a cavapoo who's four weeks younger and he's three times the size of her. So she, she's meant to be a lot bigger, but she's, she's added a new dimension to my life that I didn't think possible. Um, I've never lived with an animal before. I've never had to care for something like 24 seven. The arrangement I had with my girlfriend was, you know, she was going to do all the work and I was going to tolerate having a pet. And it's kind of like role reversal. Like I take her out for walks in the evening and feed her and care for her and always pick her up and stuff. She's just like, yeah, it, it's, it's reframed uh, my perspective actually on on eating animals as well, um, which I never thought I would actually get to. Um, I've understood it from a rational point of view, but but even that, like just having her in my life is, um, is is really making me question a lot of things. So yeah, that, that's my long-winded answer to me having a puppy for a year. I love it. It's great. <laughs> oh, that's, that's so interesting. And there are lots of health benefits of having pets, aren't there? And I bet you've appreciated those firsthand. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there's all these studies looking at how living with pets or being in constant con con contact with animals improves your gut microbe diversity and why um, certain people who, well, there's the more extreme end of when you grow up on a farm and you have better diversity, you're less likely to experience ATP for probably a number of other reasons as well, like vitamin D and exercise and fresh water and all the rest of it. But living with an animal definitely has an impact on your microbial diversity, which I find fascinating. So I can't say that I've noticed any particular health benefits, particularly when she was disturbing my sleep for the per first six months. Um, if anything, it's a net negative. But but yeah, no, it's uh, it, it's it's very interesting to see what will happen over the next few years. Oh, and that is absolutely fascinating, isn't it? We'll definitely go on to talk about the gut microbiome in a bit. But first, I want to congratulate you on this book, Three, Two, One. <laughs> Um, for listeners who haven't seen it, who haven't read it, it's amazing. I absolutely love it. It's beautifully written. It's simple. It's accessible. It doesn't go into complex nutritional detail. It just kind of gives you just what you need to know. And so I want to congratulate you. It's a brilliant book. For people who don't know, what is the three, two, one concept? Yeah, so thank you so much, first of all. And you're right, it's definitely a more streamlined and simplified book than my previous two that were quite heavy on the nutritional science, which I never want to shy away from. But I think it's very important to get to the crux of why people struggle with eating well. 
every day because it's not the inclusion of particular foods or following a diet for a specified amount of time it's about the cumulative impact of your dietary pattern over many years that compound in terms of the health benefits and so really the root of the problem is making healthy eating sustainable for life and that's where 3 to 1 comes from so 3 to 1 means three portions of fruit vegetables nuts or seeds per person two servings per recipe and only using one pan so you can make stir fries curries casseroles tray bakes you name it you can make it in one pan and it genuinely it's the way i eat particularly if i'm working late and i've got a shift or you know i come back at 8 p.m and i don't know what to eat the last thing you want is a complicated recipe which involves pots and pans and turning the oven on or getting the food processor out so all the recipes are streamlined from a process point of view and to minimize washing up but the other benefit of that is that it actually concentrates a lot of the flavors so in the curry section because you're just using one singular pan you're getting the biggest impact of all these different herbs and spices and instead of you know doing the tarka in like one dish and then adding it to your lentils and that it's all in one pan so you're not missing any flavor um and, and just for the audience tarka is like a, the flavored oil that you put onto a traditional uh, lentil stew uh, for want of a better word and um the other thing that i think is really important to recognize and it's like an uncomfortable truth um is that we need to be eating more vegetables. And when I say more, I mean like a lot more than five a day. Um, it's around 800 grams, which equates to 10 a day. And, and that's when I talk to people about that, like that, that's just ridiculous. Like who on earth is going to be eating mountains of vegetables and pears and nuts and all that kind of stuff? Well, you know, when you break it down meal by meal, it, it's a very achievable with a three, two, one formula, and it leaves. Uh, it also includes things like onions and pepper, and you know when you add certain fruits to your your meal as well. So you know it doesn't need to be like a big head of broccoli every meal time. It, it, it can be portioned, and you'd be surprised what a portion actually looks like. It's not that big, um, and I think it explains a lot behind a plant-focused diet in terms of the health benefits behind um, uh, veganism or vegetarianism that's born out in observational studies. Um, And and I just kind of want to bring that to as many people as possible without, you know, insinuating that you need to be 100% plant-based. I love it. It's so accessible to everyone, no matter what your dietary preference. And that's one of the things that I really like about it. And the other thing I like about it is that it's one pan. For me, I love cooking, <laughs> but I detest the cleaning up afterwards. I hate it when I have loads of like yeah. massive oven trays that I have to then clean up and, and, and tidy away. But this is another way that your book buys back time. Was this one of your aims with the book that time is an issue and one of the pain points you wanted to buy back time? Yeah, massively. So I, th- one of the things that I did before formulating this book, because my aspiration was was never to become an author. It was kind of just, um, la- it just landed in my em- email box, email inbox, and you know I got an agent, and then they were like, you know, we think you could do a book, and this is before there were a, a flux of, of people doing books on this on this subject matter in the UK at least, anyway. Um, and so when I started writing, it was from a point of view in that I wanted people to learn about the information. The more I've done it over the last couple of years, the more I've had the pleasure of interacting with people on social media, in addition to my patient experience as well, patient doctor experience. So it's I, I've learned a lot about what the barriers are to eating. And it's in a nutshell, it's motivation time huge huge factor and also the sort of um byproducts of cooking one of which is washing up right and and the mental energy it takes not just to create a meal but deal with the the horrendous state of your kitchen afterwards and it, and you know that ingrains in your memory whether you consciously are aware of it or not you know the thought of cooking is not just the prep time and the cook time is the washing up time. And in fact, you know, I, I think I should start a campaign for all cookbooks to have prep time, cook time, and wash time 
as part of the standard sort of formula. But I might do that in the, ne- in the next book if I write another one. Um, but yeah, so it's uh, for, for me, it was learning a lot about that. It was getting feedback from the community online and my newsletter. It was surveying thousands of people, literally thousands of people. We sent out questionnaires to find out what the barriers and pain points were. And that's where the concept of 321 was, was born out of. Um, and so if we can if we can really tackle that, um, then you know we can make cooking from scratch an easy thing to do, and then we have the opportunity to steer people in a way that's a lot more aligned with uh, what the best health outcomes could be. Well, I think you're perfectly carrying out your mission. I think it's a brilliant book, and I think that people should definitely pick it up and read it. It it definitely buys back time, uh, but not only that, I feel like it makes it very easy for you to do so. It's not it's simple and you know, it, it, no fuss, no fuss cooking, which is what I love. Now, Rupi, I just want to slightly change tack a little bit and talk about your TEDx talk, because I listened to your TEDx talk and it's okay. really hard hitting and really powerful. So I do think, you know, I encourage everyone to listen to it too. And you start off by talking about how as a junior doctor at a young age, you know, early 20s, you witnessed the death of a lady. And I could really relate to that because there's medical as a medical student coming out of medical school as a junior doctor I was under the illusion that once we're on the wards I'd be saving lives not losing them so how did this experience shape your philosophy on health um, and then in particular on prevention oh thanks yeah no it, it was a real pleasure to do a TED talk to be asked to do a TED talk particularly in Bristol which is where we started our uh, culinary medicine program at the at the medical school um but yeah that i think every medic has that vivid experience of unfortunately losing a patient for the first time which is an inevitable part of the job and i think we all go into medicine with um quite a, a disillusioned perspective of what we're actually going to be doing on a day-to-day basis. Like we're going to be running up and down the wards, we're going to be saving people, you know, using the defibrillator every other day. Like, you know, all, all these all these sort of images that are conjured up as to what a doctor does. And in reality, um, we fight many battles. And I think the one against preventable disease is one that we, we don't do very well. And that was a stark realization for me early on. And I, I'm, I'm grateful that I had that realization very early because it has certainly shaped my opinion of what I really wanted to do. Um, initially, when I, when I qualified, I wanted to go into surgery. I wanted to do a lot more sort of intervention stuff. The, the idea of um, saving lives in slow motion, which is a, a concept that's pioneered by A.M. Um, Panju, who's a fantastic general practitioner, but that never really appealed to me. Um, and I think, as we'll talk about a bit later on with my own anecdotal experience of, of ill health, it, it, you know, it became a, a lot more of an attractive thing to do, thing to dedicate myself to, saving lives in, in slow motion. And that's through those little sustainable changes that people can do themselves to protect their own health such that we lessen the burden on the healthcare system and we can react to those acute issues but we can prevent them as much as possible and that's something that we don't do very well so so that experience um as an unfortunate and and as horrific as it was for a young individual really has to this day shaped my opinion of medicine luckily for me i can intertwine a whole bunch of my passions with cooking with talking communication um, as well as medicine absolutely I'm a big fan of Dr Aryan Panja actually so I will chat to him and I love that phrase saving lives in slow motion and um, you used to actually give your patients recipes didn't you sat there in the GP surgery you used to sort of prescribe them a, a, a kind of um, yeah. oat recipe for example did you do that quite uh, quite often yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny with that TED talk, I had to cut down so much stuff because you need to get it into, I think it's like 13 or 14 minutes or so. So I had this long story about the very first time I started giving recipes to patients. And I remember this guy coming in vividly, you know, he'd 
he'd want to Im- improve his blood work and w- we had to you know, do a few things. We talked about pharmaceuticals. And I thought, oh, why don't I talk to this guy about food? And so we talked about his breakfast and it was, you know, your, your typical normal breakfast, right? Eating what his kids were eating, refined carbohydrates, high sugar, bit of juice, uh, maybe a cup of tea. Um, and I said, well, why don't, why don't you do oats? And you're like, I, I don't mind oats, we can do oats. And uh, I went through this recipe with him. I said, you add your oats, you add some nuts, and these are healthy fats, and this is why you need it. It's good fiber, yada, yada. Why don't you try that? And then as he left, he asked me, what's the, you know, how do you make oats, first of all, before you start adding all these other things to it? <laughs> and I was like, ah, oh, and that's when the penny dropped. It was like, people don't know how to cook. Like very simple things that people don't know how to cook. So I spent a lot of time with that new perspective going really to the basics. And I got this reputation in my general practice, uh, general practice surgery where I was working as a registrar at the time um, of being the doctor who would talk to patients about food. And so I had this like almost expectation um, for some patients who came in who were like, okay, so, you know, I've got um, uh, these issues with my bloods or this cholesterol problem, or I weight big, big, you know, a, a, a very big trigger for a lot of people to come see me. Um, you know, what can I eat and stuff? And so I, sp- I spent literally so many times being late in the morning cleaning, the evening cleaning. So I was writing down recipes for people, <laughs> having full on conversations with them. And uh, I just knew back then it was just like completely unsustainable. And that's where the idea of the doctor's kitchen came from. It was a way to harness the power of technology and social media to scale up information about how people can look at food in a different way and eat their way to health um, using a very sort of basic uh, approach in the kitchen um, and using food as, as a motivator. So, so yeah, that was uh, uh, that was <laughs> that was my journey from from being the the young registrar. Uh, giving food advice and recipes and always running late in clinic to to starting the doctor's kitchen uh, on YouTube and and Instagram. (laughs) That's fascinating because I had that sort of similar penny drop experience where you realize that people don't always know these terms that you talk about, that you feel like they automatically know because you've been, you've grown up in a particular way. And it's, education alongside the recipes that I love that you do so well and in your book what you say if I can just read a little quote is that eating well is not just about removing foods that potentially cause disease it's about consuming foods that amplify our defenses against getting ill in the first place. Can you tell us how this leads to the concept of eating more not less? Yeah, so um, the title for that in the in the last book, three, two, one, was um, intentionally tongue in cheek because I think, particularly last year, um, we, we've been told that we have to all go on a diet because of COVID and the pandemic, and we're all sort of uh, overweight. And of course, you know, with a third of adults pre-diabetes, the rising rates of all these different metabolic problems weight is definitely an issue but the perspective that i want people to understand is that our diet consists of nutrient poor calorie and energy dense rich items whereas actually we need to reverse that and the way to do that is to eat more but eat more of the quality fruits and vegetables it also has a veneer of being um, inaccessible and expensive and that's the other thing I, i try and do with all my books is to to highlight those hero foods that are humble and cheap. Um, A peasant style diet with grains and beans and red cabbage and all these different things that are literally cost pennies, but might need a bit more education and motivation around to actually prepare from scratch are key to health. And we need to eat more of those sorts of foods. And it also ties into the, the principles of healthy eating that have sort of uh, influenced every recipe that I've made uh, from book one, which is this concept of being plant forward or plant focused, um, color. So eating more of those different colors, 
quality fats and that, that gets into a discussion about the different types of fats and the hierarchy of different fats which i'm sure you you wax lyrical about on the podcast and in clinic as well um and fiber uh, as well as eating whole and so moving to the less processed and and uh uh, away from the the highly refined uh, uh, products that unfortunately litter our supermarket shelves. So this concept of eating more is 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 definitely tongue in cheek. It's actually you know uh, the antithesis of what you might expect a doctor to say in terms of well you need to reduce your portion size and you need to cut this and you need to count these calories. It's actually no, we need to really reframe our thinking to one that is a lot more inviting, joyful. And appreciative of all the different cultural uh, cuisine, uh, different uh, cuisines from different cultures that we have in the UK. I mean, that's something to be celebrated and enjoyed. Um, and I, I don't want people to think about healthy food in a restrictive manner. Yeah. And I think that's excellent. And I think your book does that really well. And it's got influences from around the world. And you also talk about how the bias of modern medicine towards giving prescription medications is not because of this massive corporate conspiracy, mm. but it's because it's actually easier to perform studies where you can compare one drug to another drug. And you can do that really robustly in an excellent, you know, conclusive manner. But it's a lot harder to do that with nutritional studies. And nutritional studies, you really have to be trained to interpret them. But I think, as you mentioned, there are some clear takeaways from the vast body of work that has gone into nutrition. And can you just tell us those main takeaway points that are clear and pretty much, you know, and indisputable? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think you're right um, with regards to the differences between um, the different scientific disciplines and how easy it is to perform those robust pharmaceutical trials versus diet, um, which is an infinitely difficult. I mean, time of day when you eat has an impact. The uh, yes, energy content definitely has an impact. The proportion of different macronutrients the um, quality of each ingredient, the combination of the ingredients. And that's before so you get to the point of, yeah. yeah, and that's before you even get to the expense of performing those trials and actually getting a participant yeah. to stick with the trials because eating isn't just something we do three times a day. It's something that we do, you know, five, six times a day sometimes. Uh, and we, we have a whole bunch of other influences on, on that kind of stuff. Also, the other thing is... Um, no one stands to benefit from a hugely expensive trial that demonstrates this particular diet that includes broccoli and watercress and beans is fantastic uh, uh, versus the trial that looks at the new and latest drug um, that has a clear defined outcome and that can uh, generate billions of dollars of revenue. Um, and obviously we need those, we need both of those, but the, the, it's definitely skewed in one direction. So the, the clear takeaways are those principles of healthy eating that are, are sort of like, I would say my bias, but I, I would like to think that my bias is underpinned by a lot of the studies that um, I, I've come across and, and read over the last 10 years. So plant focused eating, if you look at the number of huge observational studies um, it's very clear that a plant predominant diet yields better health outcomes in a preventative manner. You're less likely to have disease. You're less likely to um, suffer uh, early death uh, and morbidity. Um, it's about health span as well as lifespan. The inherent issues with having an observational study to demonstrate that are that um, it can't be uh, proven for an individual. There are a lot of other factors that can lead to interpretation bias, no matter how many numbers you have. Um, and, and it's very hard to tease that out, um, uh, looking at just the, the data as, as it is in observational studies. So that's certainly one area that, that underpins my core belief in that we need to have more plants. And when I say more plants, I mean 85 to 90%. Um, and we'll get to a cardiovascular point of view, but it's the Mediterranean diet, which includes fish as well. The other thing is fiber. Mm -hmm. So uh, fiber is this fascinating uh, field that pertains to the gut health, where we, we're constantly talking about the microbiota, which is the population of microbes that live in and around our body, largely in our gut, but also on our skin and our mouths and the vagina, uh, in our lungs. Uh, you know, it's, it's incredible just how many areas of our 
body are populated by foreign microbes that confer benefits to the host rather than what we've traditionally thought to believe are pathogens. Um, And so the best way to think about gut health is how to give them the food such that they thrive and uh, create neurotransmitters, balance inflammation, uh, modulate sugar. Um, And the best way to do that is to give them lots of different types of interesting food in the form of fiber. And there are prebiotic fibers, which are specialized types of fibers like uh, garlic or chicory or even certain like the stems of asparagus that are specific in that they, um, they, they have a particular beneficial effect on microbes and, and their diversity and allow them to thrush. But in general, all types of fiber are fantastic, whether they're coming from beans and nuts or seeds. But again, it ties in with the whole plant-focused theory as to why a plant-focused diet has, has so many benefits. The other thing is quality fats. Now, this is pretty divisive, depending on who you speak to, um, about fats and the uh, the energy in, energy out dogma that I, I feel is, is quite flawed in nutritional science. Um, but quality fats in the form of nuts and seeds uh, have have demonstrated, have been demonstrated in actual intervention trials as well as those observational studies looking at the the amount that is consumed in a diet to be beneficial from a cardiovascular perspective has been shown to be kind of protective which kind of flies in the face of our initial theories about calories in calories out um and and fats in general um but i i I think it's to do with the different uh ratios of polyunsaturated versus monounsaturated and the carbon chain lengths of those uh, different uh, amounts as well. Um, I, I don't want to harbor the point too much, but every fat contains all different types of um, uh, of saturated and unsaturated fats in them, but in varying ratios. So it's about the ratios. But in general, people don't eat saturated fat or unsaturated. They eat food. And that's why nuts, seeds, um, cold-pressed oils are fantastic for, for uh, general well-being. Uh, colors. So, uh, the, the, uh, if you look at my recipes in books or online, you, you'll notice they always have colors. And, and again, this kind of ties in with a three to one um, theme because you want to try and get as many different colors as possible such that it represents um, the micronutrients as well as those phytonutrients uh, in food. So, micronutrients are the traditional vitamins and minerals that we've all been told that we need to have X amount of. They're essential in that we consume them from food. We can't create them ourselves. But then you've got this whole other field of phytonutrients, which are plant chemicals that you find in your humble apple, like quercetin or quercetin uh, or allicin in garlic. Um, And we know that these have um, fantastic benefits, not in supplemental doses, but also in culinary doses as well, which again, you know, I, you can see how all this is stacking up towards a plant predominant diet and why that, that might have uh, beneficial effects. And the other thing is whole food. And I think most people understand the concept of um, this refined versus uh, uh, whole uh, food in, in terms of how our food exists on a spectrum. So on one side, you have your highly refined sugar. Um, or a, a flour where it's been taken from a whole wheat into this form here. And on the other side, you've got raw food like leeks or onion or, or potato that's pulled from the ground. Now, obviously, we don't want to just be eating raw food because some degree of processing actually increases the bioavailability of the micronutrients and those phytonutrients, which is why when you steam a piece of broccoli, it goes this vibrant, dark, earthy green color rather than the sort of mild green color. And that's a a very simple experiment to show you that we don't need to be only eating raw food. You actually need some processing. Even chewing is a form of processing. But on the spectrum, we're far towards the process end rather than this end. And I think universally looking at observational studies again, but also interventional studies, um, it's, it's very clear we need to be eating more whole so so those are the the principles of of healthy eating that i I describe in in most of the books and in a bit more detail i believe in uh book two um but uh that's certainly what you'll get from any doctor's kitchen recipe or or be a recipe that's imbued with that sort of thinking 
um, uh, without having to, to know all the science behind it. Yeah, And I love that you state that the concept of five a day is so ingrained into our um, systems through public health messaging. But actually what we should be having is 10 a day. But your book does actually make that um, achievable as well because when you think 10 a day it's really difficult to know how to get all of that in how to get it in when you're thinking about time when you're thinking about expense when you're thinking about preparation but I do urge people to look at your book and see that you know there are so many different ideas of how you can achieve that which I love and a question that I'm always asked is does it have to be organic and it it, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so it's a, it's a common question I'm asked. And I think in terms of priorities, my number one priority is to get more people eating plants. Yeah. Um, and a secondary priority that isn't underpinned with robust science is uh, eat organic if you can. The reasons why I say that is because I'm taking a pragmatic approach rather than one that's uh, clearly demonstrated in, in studies. There are a lot of unknown unknowns and probably unknowns and unknown unknowns as well about um, pesticide use. We know certainly it has an impact on the environment, uh, which is negative. Um, and we know that we need to create a more sustainable method of um, food production that demonstrates yield benefits as well as um, uh, nutrient benefits as well. But for now, I think that's a question for later. The the biggest problem the elephant in the room if you like is we're not eating enough of the plants to start off with um before we and and the other thing i I like to remind people of is um our bodies are like incredible detoxifying machines such that i'm here in the middle of london i'm right next to a busy road with clear environmental pollutants that are emitted from uh, the machines that whiz up and down and we are still thriving that there are, you know, many patients and I'm not by any means promoting smoking here, but there are many patients who will ingest and inhale a known carcinogen up to 20, 30, 40 times a day sometimes for years before they succumb to something like a cancer. So having that perspective about food as well, I think is very important. We can We can deal with a little bit of pesticide that might be shown to be um uh harmful um but the ma- the major issue is we're not eating enough of the vegetables themselves that confer benefits and i love it. you you actually state in your book that our body is better able to deal with air pollution when we're eating healthy vegetables and food that m- nourishes our gut microbiome i was mm. it blew my mind actually i have to say i hadn't heard of that before yeah yeah so there's a couple of reasons why um food can help with your natural innate detoxification mechanisms now when whenever anyone mentions the word detox and mine you, you automatically think of like those teas or those tablets that you you know cause you to have diarrhea and stuff don't don't ever buy any of that kind of stuff you, and you don't need to you know do a, a cleanse of your of your body to do that um but there, there are two main here. ways in which <laughs> there are two there are two main ways in which your body can do that so um one is fiber. So uh, uh, one of the, the main ways in which we get rid of um, uh, xenoestrogens and other environmental pollutants is through our poop. And so making sure you're having regular bowel habits actually removes environmental pollutants as well. And the other way is um, uh, by providing cofactors for your normal detoxification process in your liver. So there's phase one, there's phase two, and those require different B vitamins and and even some phytonutrients have been shown to improve that pathway as well. Like sulforaphane that you find in broccoli. So actually having lots of greens in your diet is one way of potentially heightening your, your natural mechanisms. Um, but it won't do something like charcoal, for example. That, that, that's, that's literally something we use in an accident and emergency setting where we try and pull out um, those, uh, th- those agents um, for if you've ingested a uh, pharmaceutical. So... So yeah, uh, that, that that's one way I think. It's, I'm glad you brought that up because I think um, a lot of people think they have to take something exogenous to our, our bodies to, to remove pollutants, whereas actually we're doing this all the time. Yeah. And you also talked about the um, topic that I find absolutely fascinating, which is nutrigenomics and the fact that food can actually 
alter the genetic function of our cells. It blows my mind. How does this work? Yeah, so um, the whole concept of nutrigenomics is about introducing stimuli that uh, will change the expression of your genes. So not the sequence that's inherited by mother and father, but the expression of your genes can be influenced by things like stress, things like um, food, things like sunlight, movement, uh, a whole bunch of things can, can change what happens in the nuclei of your cell and how that changes proteins that are coded, different sorts of enzymes, and ultimately whether you're putting your uh, body in a protective state or one that is uh, uh, vulnerable. Um, and I had a full conversation ab about this with a, a registered dietitian on my, my podcast where she explained the different concepts. And I always thought DNA tests and, and genomics is kind of a little bit left field for me and I didn't really fully understand it. But I, I'm more um, inclined towards the idea of personalized dietary regimens now um, than I thought of before. I think the very general principles are the same, if I'm honest. Um, but there might be ways in which to tweak uh, what we eat according to um, our, our DNA profile. Um, but yeah, so the, the general concept of nutrigenomics is putting your, your, your body in the best state. And again, it kind of <laughs> it mirrors all very much the same things that I was talking about earlier, plant forward, lots of quality fats, as well as the other things like meditation, stress relieving techniques and movement. Absolutely. And it all boils down to the same techniques, doesn't it? These these things that we're now finding in lots of different ways from lots of different sources in the body that they actually help us. So, you know, being plant focused, eating fiber, having good fats. Now, talking about fats, um, as a cardiologist, I do, you're right, you mentioned earlier, talk about this all the time. And there is a causal link between having high cholesterol levels and furring up of the blood vessels in your body. And in particular, the blood vessels of the heart, what we call atherosclerosis. And historically, you know, and from studies, saturated fat is implicated. But this has been quite controversial recently with people saying, actually, no, we should be eating more saturated fat. What is your take on this? Because I know patients come to me really confused about what should, they should do to protect their heart. Um, and I think the messaging out there can sometimes be a bit confusing. Yeah, you're right. It's a it's a really confusing subject, even for someone who's involved in looking at the studies and you know um, listening to different sort of different opinions on this. Um, my perspective has pretty much remained the same in that uh, we need to take more of a food approach rather than a, a micronutrient or a macronutrient approach. Because if I if I say to a patient, you need to eat less saturated fat. What does that what does that actually mean? And and in my head, as soon as I said saturated fat, I had I conjured the image of a burger. And a burger, whilst it has saturated fat in the meat, it's also got a lot of refined carbohydrates. So it's it's almost like the combinations of food that we consume can have an impact of, on on cardiovascular disease. And and to to tease out just one element, particularly when we look at observational studies, is um there's a lot of shortcomings with that. It's very, it's very nerve. However, uh, I think on the on the balance of things, um, reducing food that has that combination of refined carbohydrates, uh, high amounts of saturated fat that are generally uh, found in red meat, processed meats, um, and, uh, uh, and 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 even other uh, types of, um, uh, of foods as well will yield cardioprotective benefits. So what does mm. that look like? Well, it, it looks like a plant-predominant plant diet with some inclusion of fish. And, and the reason why I say inclusion of fish is because, you know, my bias, if you like, is from a Mediter Mediterranean diet, with, which, which also has fish in. And that's the only diet that has been demonstrated to have that impact on a on large scale. If you ask certain vegan doctors, they will agree, actually, that, a Mediterranean diet that includes fish has benefits in the Mediterranean diet. However, their bias towards animal welfare 
tips them towards a, a vegan persuasion, which is totally fine. It depends on you know who you're speaking to. You don't think we should go fully vegan for health benefits, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So my my perspective is that we should be um, eating a variety of different foods. A whole food plant based diet definitely ticks all the boxes from that perspective. Um, the need to go 100 percent plant based, I think, is more of an ethical question rather than an environmental question as well, rather than a purely human health and nutritional one. Um, I, I also think that, uh, that there is this pervasive myth that if you eat meat in any, like even small quantities, then you're, you're going to be damaging your health. And I, I don't think that's right. I don't think we have the evidence to say if you have a steak every two or three weeks that you're going to be putting your health at a significant harm. I, I don't think that's, that's correct. Um, but but when it comes to the question of, you know, should you be eating more saturated Definitely not. Uh, we definitely shouldn't be eating more saturated the, the main issue is that we eat too much of the animal products that have high amounts of saturated fat. And saturated fat might just be one of the elements that is causing harm. There's also nitrates in there. There's also um, uh, the way we prepare the meat in terms of the carcinogens that are released from grilling the food. Um, there's a whole bunch of other um, proteins that can damage your gut microbiota when consumed in large amounts. Like it's not it's not just about the saturated fat. Uh, and I think the other thing is um, what we do know is when you consume high amounts of saturated fat from all those multiple sources, it raises your level of LDL cholesterol. And there's this myth that you know uh, it, it doesn't matter if your LDL cholesterol is raised. That's not to do with cardiac risk that that's wrong you know if you if your ldl cholesterol you, you've got to think about it from from a, a an engineering point of view as well if you have high amounts of a lipoprotein that carries cargo in the form of cholesterol cursing around your body in an environment where you've got inflammation as a result of maybe stress or high sugar or you know a whole bunch of other factors then the likelihood of that cargo landing into your artery and causing that inflammatory atherosclerotic process is obviously going to be higher so ldl raised is definitely going to be a risk factor and if your saturated fat increases your ldl then you're you're going to have an increased risk it it, it doesn't make sense to say anything out, uh, outside that what is also true is that you can have a raised ldl and have no cardiac disease. That that's true as well. But that doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't worry about high LDL. No, we should always try and minimize risk. Um, and yeah, it, it's a it's a very complicated very complicated field, but um, one that I, I'm glad that we we're clarifying. No, I agree, and I agree with what you said. It's the entirety of the diet, isn't it? Um, if you have you know a burger on the odd occasion, then providing that for the majority of the time you eat as you say a plant-focused diet which is high in fiber and high in good fats then absolutely you know that's absolutely fine and it leads us onto this concept of good food versus bad food and that I think mm. is really tricky because it assigns blame I think to people and when you then have that odd packet of Haribo's on a night shift or on a difficult work day or when you're you know busy with the kids then you can feel this real sense of blame as well. And I love that you in your social media put a bucket of Haribo's occasionally there to say, you know what, we all have this on occasions. Um, what do you think about good food and bad yeah. food? I mean, I've always thought this is a tricky concept and a troublesome one. How about you? Yeah, you know, it's a very tricky concept because um, as someone who has spent a lot of time on social media, um, I witness the good and the bad. So, so when I put out healthy meals and and you know content about how you can improve your health, I'm speaking to a particular person or, or range or demographic of people who are who are really interested in healthy eating and who have genuine um, intentions about improving their health. However, as we've noticed over the last few years with with Instagram and other um, uh, picture-based social media platforms, there is a growing concern around eating disorders and an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. And I, I did a post recently about how I described myself as just a big microphone. And that microphone is great because you can get to lots of people, but it also means you're gonna get collateral issues in the form of my content being presented to someone 
for whom it's not appropriate. And really, we need to encourage people to be filters of their own digital landscape because it can't, well, at the moment, I'm just a microphone and all I can be is a microphone. I can't be a specific, you know, t- laser targeted weapon, if you like, you know, with, with a, where I can target certain people with, with the, the right information. And I think that's why I steer clear of um, black and white messages of good and, and bad food. Um, yes, certainly we know the attributes of a diet that is generally going to be healthy. Um, but that isn't to say that if you include some foods that are in the bad list, quote unquote, um, that, you know, it's going to lead yield uh, incredible health issues in the future. I think food is, is there to be enjoyed first and foremost. You know, we've got Eid coming up. We've just had Easter with Christmas a few months ago. I've got my birthday in a couple of months. You know, I, I want to have food used as pleasure and food as something to in, enjoy as well as um, food uh, to fuel me and to ensure that I'm functioning correctly. Absolutely. And firstly, I really applaud you for your um, really sort of mature approach to social media. You really use it very effectively as a tool. And you openly say, if this triggers anything within you, if my feed triggers you, then unfollow me. And it's a really Mm. open, honest, refreshing way to approach social media. And so I really want to thank you for that, because I think it's really important for people like yourselves to say that. And Secondly, you mentioned Eid, and it is currently the month of Ramadan. So before we move Mm. on, I do want to discuss fasting very quickly. So you have a wonderful chapter in your book about fasting. It's a very confusing topic, even to me. Um, Can you tell us, in a nutshell, why can fasting be beneficial? Yeah, it's a very confusing topic, and it's confusing because sometimes you read academic papers and they confuse the terms right so intermittent fasting can refer to so many different forms of fasting whether it be 16 8 5 2 um uh, even like a 12 hour fast that, that can all be intermittent fasting so the terminology that we use is very vague and it needs to be uh, a lot more defined um particularly when you realize uh that Certain forms of fasting are beneficial for for certain people versus other forms of fasting that could be at the detriment of people's health. Uh, And I know this intuitively, like if I was to do a water fast for three or four days, my gut would have a party like it it, it just wouldn't wouldn't be very good from an uh, acidic point of view. And, you know, maybe I could practice it a few times and, and ramp it up slowly to a point where I can tolerate it a bit more. But I don't think that's going to have a beneficial effect because um, I, I've done some personal experiments where my thyroid uh, function is disturbed. Um, it affects my concentration. Where certain people do those forms of fasting and they thrive. So the overarching uh, point I, I want to get across to people is fasting is a is a potential great therapeutic tool. The issue we have is that we don't know the dose of fasting and what dose is appropriate for which patient that that's the overarching message when it comes to the benefits of fasting there are potential benefits from from a number of different reasons um insulin sensitivity so improving one's sensitivity to the hormone that regulates sugar as well as um uh, fat deposition as well uh the the, the regulation of, of fuel in our, in our muscle cells so that's that's one thing, and, and and given that we have an issue with metabolic syndrome in the UK and and globally as well, it's a, it's a very important um, potential tool in our clinical toolbox. Um, the other thing is, uh, and this relates to weight as well, and weight maintenance and, and sugar balance and, and stuff like that. Um, the other big point is around longevity. Um, so when you fast, what happens is a process called autophagy is upregulated and autophagy in simple terms is the recycling of components from your cell into new spranking brand new cells so it's kind of like uh, if you imagine a highway of cars and on 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 this highway you have a brand new ferrari a brand new 
uh, Mercedes Benz, but on the same one, you have a bunch of old cars that's been hanging around and causing smoke to go everywhere and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So it's basically the, the process of removing those cars with a big forklift, mm. taking them to the dump, shining up all their materials, making them all brand spanking new, and then making a whole set of new Ferrari cars to put in your highway. That's essentially autophagy, uh, the process of autophagy. And that leads to some longevity benefits, um, reduced inflammation benefits, and potential uh, uh, prevention of cancer benefits as well. Yeah. So in a nutshell, there are a few things that I think are beneficial with regards to fasting, um, but we just don't know the right therapeutic dose and, and whether people can actually maintain a method. But, but fasting is very important. As, as you just mentioned, you know, Eve and Lent and, um, and every culture has a fasting uh, process, which is very interesting. I, th- I think there's definitely something in our evolutionary history that has heightened to us the importance of fasting. I, th- I think we need to reestablish a relationship with it. Yeah, fascinating. I find it fascinating. When I was burnt out, tried to fast in Ramadan, and I felt absolutely horrendous. Mm. And I Mm. like what you say about doing what's right for you, because fasting is a great tool for people for whom it works. And it doesn't work for everyone. And it's not for everyone. And so for people Mm. who are ill, for people who are burnt out, even, it can be counterproductive. Mm. So it's knowing your body and listening to your body. I think that's really important. Absolutely. Now, Rippy, I've been a fan of yours from the outset. I, you know, I prescribed your book once and um, my patient came back with better <laughs> yeah, blood pressure and better heart <laughs> rhythm issues. And, you know, I took all the credit. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and you have very much sort of um, coined the term food is medicine. Do you believe that food is medicine? Very much so. Yeah. So I, I, um, I did a, a daily podcast episode on this um recently and it was it was about the concept of 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 medicine in itself um what do we mean when we say medicine and i think if you have a a narrow definition of what medicine is i.e the prescription of pharmaceuticals um the performance of surgery um then food doesn't qualify uh, by that standard at all however medicine is the use of substances and interventions that prevent disease and treat illness. And I think by those definitions, food qualifies as medicine in the same way sleep, exercise, talking therapy, just conversation. Sometimes it can be touch that can be truly medicinal to people. So I think, you know, clarifying exactly what we mean by food as medicine is important, but it definitely is a clinical tool and it's certainly a medicine that I think has its roots in um, uh, cultural and, and certainly our cultural history, but but certainly um, it, it should be recognized as such. Food is not a pill, yeah. but food is medicine. Yeah, absolutely, guys. Get all the books. I've got them all and they're brilliant. And I feel that there's been a real evolution in your approach. I can see it. The first is very much the kind of the blueprint, the message, the um, the call to action. And then the second is, right, a very systems-based approach. And then the third is so much more practical in terms of, right, now we've actually got to do it. So this is a, a, a roadmap almost for doing it. So, yeah, thank you for writing your books. It's really interesting that you became a very accidental author, but they've certainly done so much good in the world. I've got some quick fire questions in a three, okay. three, two, one approach. Did you see what I did there? Okay. So you're, okay. <laughs> you're going to a desert island, Rupi, and okay. you can only take three vegetables. Which ones would you take and why? Oh, okay. Um, Oh, this is a tough one. So I, I would take um, fennel. Um, I love fennel. <laughs> I would take chickpeas. And mm-hmm. I would also take... Oh, what else would I take? What else would I take? Oh, it, it'd have to be um, uh, 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 broccoli. Tender stem broccoli in particular. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Fennel, chickpeas, yeah. tender stem, broccoli. Amazing. Yeah. Two, you can take two spices. Now, we didn't talk much about spices, but you can take two of your favorite spices. And so which ones would you take and why? Uh, fennel and cumin. 
um, because I, I think fennel and cumin match each other beautifully as a blend. Uh, cumin brings me back to that Middle Eastern vibes. Fennel is Mediterranean, but you know, combination is um, yeah, it's it's great. Yeah, and you couldn't live without those, could you? If they were just no. whipped from the spice <laughs> no, spectrum. <definitely> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> and finally, number one, one. What is your one favorite dish that you would take? Uh, my favorite dish I would take would probably be my my mum's uh, almond chicken curry. Actually, um, it's uh, it's delicious. It's really really good, and uh, I uh, yeah, I, I would have that every day happily. <laughs> is that the recipe that's in the book? Yeah, I'm actually, a chicken yeah. curry. I was looking at that thinking, oh, maybe we'll do that this weekend. So yeah, you've inspired yeah. me. Thank you, Rupi. <laughs> oh, so Rupi, no thank you so much. This part of the podcast now is over, but I really just want to say again that I love your cookbook. It gives back. It's the cookbook that gives back for me. It gives back time. It gives back money. It gives back energy. And ultimately, which is your aim, um, which is to give back health. So it's a wonderful cookbook and I encourage everyone to take a look at it and try out the recipes. So thank you, Rupi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for tuning in. If someone you know could find this episode helpful, then please do share. You can check out all the other episodes on our website, freshheartproject.com. We would be really grateful if you could comment, subscribe, and give this a five-star rating. This helps us get the fresh heart message to more people. The content of this episode is not a substitute for medical advice from your healthcare professional. Remember, be kind to yourself and small, sustainable steps create great change. This podcast is produced by Lion Mountain Entertainment, a subsidiary of Morgan Archway Limited.